Hello, everyone. Welcome to Lay's Real Talk. So, who are the Chinese Communist Party's friends in America, and how did they become the CCP's old friends? In my last video, I gave an overview and talked about the U.S. leading all other countries in having the most heads of state on the CCP's old friends list. Today, we will find out how the CCP got friends in the White House. President Nixon was the first U.S. president who ever visited China. His historic visit in 1972 formally recognized Communist China since the CCP took power in 1949, ending China's isolation from the world's community. His national security adviser Henry Kissinger played an important role in this historic endeavor. For this reason, Nixon and Kissinger were both given old friend honors by the CCP. Kissinger later became a loyal supporter of the CCP. He wrote an op-ed in Washington Post right after the Tiananmen Square massacre, defending the CCP's crackdown on the students by arguing that quote no government in the world would have tolerated having the main square of its capital. Occupied for eight weeks, and that a crackdown was therefore inevitable. In a span of 50 years, Kissinger visited China over 80 times and has influenced at least five U.S. administrations in their foreign policies with China. Kissinger has remained a CCP darling that no other old friend can replace. After Nixon visited China. He decided to send an envoy to act as an unofficial ambassador to Beijing in order to maintain the inroads he had made. George Bush Sr. was the second envoy Nixon sent. He stayed there for two years, from 1972 to 1974. While in China, Bush built relations with Chinese communist leaders, including Deng Xiaoping. Fifteen years later, Bush became the 41st U.S. president, and Deng was already the paramount leader of the CCP. A few months after Bush became president, in June 1989, the Tiananmen Square massacre occurred and provoked an outcry around the world. Bush immediately imposed sanctions on the Chinese Communist regime, including suspending all arms sales and military exchanges. But behind the scenes, he tried to use his diplomatic skills to smooth things out with his Chinese friend Deng. Now, another of the CCP's old friend, Richard Nixon, also stepped in. It was reported that hours after the tanks rode into the Tiananmen Square, Nixon called Bush and urged him not to let the massacre derail the relationship with China. Bush agreed. So George Herbert Walker Bush, according to his biographer, worked hard to keep the butchers of Beijing as part of the world. Bush sent a passionate personal letter to Deng Xiaoping, assuring the Chinese leader that he had quote tried very hard not to inject myself into China's internal affairs. The letter was written quote. From one who believes with a passion that good relations between the United States and China are in the fundamental interests of both countries, I have felt that way for many years. I feel more strongly that way today, in spite of the difficult circumstances. Bush's tone was almost apologetic and begging for understanding. He explained why he suspended military sales to China. Saying, the actions I took as president could not be avoided. The clamor for stronger action remains intense. He assured the Chinese leader, "I have resisted that clamor, making clear that I do not want to see destroyed this relationship that you and I have worked so hard to build." After the letter, Bush secretly sent his national security adviser, Brent Scowcroft, to China. Three weeks after the massacre, to make sure that the U.S.-China relations did not sour 
over what just happened in Tiananmen Square. Shortly after his envoy Scowcroft returned, Bush sent a second letter to Deng. This time, Bush made appeasements to the Chinese leader while suggesting that Deng show forgiveness to students and demonstrators. I have great respect for China's long-standing position about non-intervention in its internal affairs, he wrote. Because of that, I also understand that I risk straining our friendship when I make suggestions as to what might be done now. Please do not be angry with me if I have crossed the invisible threshold lying between constructive suggestion and internal interference. How did the Chinese leader respond to Bush's effusive behavior? Deng did not even budge, claiming it's his internal affair. At the time, the Chinese leader was in the middle of a major crisis. Protests were taking place on a large scale all over China. Domestic support for the students from all walks of life, including military and government officials, was overwhelming. International pressure was mounting. The top leaders' opinions on how to handle the crisis were divided. They had never felt so threatened. But the George Bush Sr. came to rescue the Chinese regime from a life-threatening self-inflicted wound. If Bush didn't send his letters or an envoy, and the international community kept pressuring the CCP like it did with South Africa to end apartheid, China might have become a democratic society and we would be in a different world now. So Deng could never forget the favor George Bush Sr. and Brent Scowcroft did for him by helping him survive in another existential crisis. For that reason, both of them were given the honor of being the CCP's old friends. The failure of the democratic world to hold the CCP accountable for the atrocities in Tiananmen Square in 1989 was the biggest setback to the Chinese people's pursuit of freedom. Bush's letters and envoys sent the wrong message to the CCP. It ultimately crushed Chinese people's hope for a free and open society that was so dear to them and emboldened the CCP in trampling its people's human rights. In the decades to come, China's human rights deteriorated to the lowest point while the entire world remained silent to this day. The setback was also a turning point that changed Chinese society. Many Chinese now felt that they couldn't afford to care about their country's political future because the bloodshed in Tiananmen Square was too high a price to pay. Freedom was only a dream. The idea of justice was far-fetched. The world saw China only as a huge consumer and cheap labor market, so Chinese people started to focus on making money. The entire Chinese society became obsessed with material possessions because there are no creative outlets and no freedom of thought, but only money to be made. In a way, when the free world failed to stand with the Chinese people in defending their freedom, we helped shape China into what it is today, and it's coming back to haunt us. Bush wrote in his 2007 book, The China Diary, I love the Chinese people. One of my dreams for our world is that these two powerful giants will continue working toward a full partnership and friendship. Bush's words make me sad. I admire the love he had for the Chinese people, but I can say that his experience with China in the 1970s actually helped him 15 years later when the Tiananmen Square massacre took place during his presidency. He forgot the most fundamental fact that a communist regime doesn't represent its people. Bush's mistake is that he got China and the CCP mixed up. Bush confused his feelings for the Chinese people with his fondness for a communist dictatorship. If he really loved the Chinese people, he would have based his policy on what's good for the people, not what's good for the regime. This is a big lesson learned. It's also one of the biggest displays of ignorance on the part of the American elite. 
They think that they know how to play the Chinese power game. They think they know who's who in China. But they've ignored the fact that the CCP is the least liked, least credible entity in China. I hope those in Washington can wake up and not make the same mistake again. We shall see. Thank you for watching. Please like and share my video. Stay tuned until next time.